were called to worship this morning with these words from Psalm 31. Praise the Lord who has shown us the wonders of divine, unfailing love, and who, for the sake of God's name, leads us and guides us. In you, O Lord, we put our trust. You are our God, and our lives are in your hands. Lord, let the light of your face shine on us as we celebrate together in your presence. Amen. The Gospel reading for today is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, God prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them, they bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If a person does not abide in me, then they're cast forth as a branch and wither. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in God's love. Amen.
As a 23-year-old newlywed, I had just moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and was learning to navigate the differing expectations of two different families of origin. We were making plans for our first year together, specifically what time we would spend with each group of relatives. His family lived in Cincinnati, a little over four hours away, and my family in Omaha, more than 15 hours away. When we called his parents to inquire about planning a visit, my mother-in-law said, just remember, visiting relatives are like a pail full of fresh fish. You're really glad to see them when they first come through the door and much gladder to see them leave if they're still around three days later. She meant to be funny, but she meant it. By contrast, in my family of origin, every vacation we ever took was spent in the homes of relatives. We never stayed less than a week. From Minot, North Dakota to Aransas Pass, Texas, it was a 26-hour drive each way to visit my Grandma Farley. This was an annual occasion, and we needed a whole week just to unbend our bodies after all of that time stuck in the car. Grandma insisted on getting 12 months worth of loving in before she allowed us to leave. As soon as we arrived, aunts and uncles from all over Texas drove up onto the lawn, all piling out into Grandma's tiny house, sprawling on floors, filling up her travel trailer in the yard and Uncle Frank's little camper attachment over his truck bed. Glorious bedlam ensued as dozens of cousins willingly chose to abide in Grandma's expansive welcome. I remember her frying buckets full of fish in a kitchen as diminutive as she was, but I do not recall her ever suggesting any of us smelled bad or that she just wished we would leave already. Abide. Abide is an important word in the Gospel of John. The Greek word is meno, which together with its cognates appears 40 times in John's Gospel. Abide means to stay, to remain, to live with, to lodge, to last, to persist, and or continue on. It isn't always positive like Grandma's unwillingness to abide, behaviors in her grandchildren like rudeness, unkindness, inhospitality, or meanness. Some things should not abide. John's Gospel says that when we abide the wrong things, well, that can have negative consequences. Wrath can abide, 336. Guilt can abide. 941. And that is not God's will, says John. In today's gospel reading, the word abide is used to suggest a physical, organic kind of abiding. Previously, in chapter 14, the word abide suggested the same kind of homey hospitality that resonates with my memories of abiding with Grandma. John 14, 23 says, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them, and we will make our home with them. In that verse, we get the sense that we are to learn the ways of hospitality. We are to make time and space here and now to welcome Jesus into our lives. The scholar Andrew Latz says, welcoming Jesus to abide in us as we abide in him is the primary and preferred way John describes discipleship. And it is the primary and preferred priority of our lives. Latz goes on to suggest that learning to abide with one another is part of abiding in and with Jesus. Those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Today's verses from chapter 15 take us in another direction. This abiding is much more than a temporary experience of cohabitation. In the first eight verses of chapter 15, the word abide is used eight times. Jesus offers an image, the vine. 
He is the vine, and we are his branches. Those living in the time and place of Jesus were very familiar with fruiting vines, which were a part of everyday life. Living so close to the earth, most people had touched and tended such vines themselves. They understood that from a central vine, branches, well, branches branch. They branch out. Some of those branches flowered, were pollinated, and produced grapes. Other branches just languished. Whether a branch was dried up and fruitless or completely covered in luscious grapes, if you cut any branch off, removing it from the vine, it was done for. Branches which remained connected to the vine lived on and had the opportunity in future seasons to still bear fruit. Branches abide in the vine, and the vine abides through its branches. John reminds us that the disciples abided with Jesus. They quite literally lived with him. And when he traveled, as he often did, they traveled with him. They showed up together like an avalanche of noisy cousins at the homes of various relatives and friends throughout Galilee and beyond. Maybe they moved on before three days, but when they did, they were still together with each other and with Jesus. The abiding of disciples with their teacher was more than an occasional visit to be concluded before someone got offended or inconvenienced by another's stay. Jesus and the disciples were deeply connected in an intimate and familial way. This passage about the vine is at the end of a long discourse in John, which includes the I am sayings. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, etc. It ends with, I am the true vine. The context of the long discourse is Jesus' farewell speech to his disciples just before he is arrested. Many scholars see a brilliant thread weaving through these I am sayings, all pointing to the meaning of the death and resurrection. In this context, the vine metaphor is especially poignant. We hear Jesus providing hope and a path forward for his disciples after he is physically removed from their gatherings. He tells them that it's better that he go away. Because if he goes away, he can be with them forever, John 16, 7. He promises that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, he will abide with them, not as a friend sharing a room during their travels, but in a real, organic way, connecting them all forever, just as a vine is connected to its branches. His teaching takes on a sacramental meaning, showing us that as believers, we are connected to him. And the community of believers are therefore connected to one another. And so when we gather around the table, just as they did on that fateful night, we mediate to one another, really and materially, the very presence of the living Christ, all of us branches of the same vine, the vine only existing as we stay connected to one another. Because he abides in us and we abide with one another, the vine lives on. He lives on through us. Latz says John characterizes abiding as intimate, enduring, personal, and reciprocal relationships between Jesus and the Spirit between Jesus and the Father, and between the Father, Son, and Spirit, and disciples. He suggests through the vine metaphor that when the community of disciples abide together, they show something of God's life. Jesus' whole ministry and even the incarnation itself can be summarized as his abiding with us. Abiding is not coerced, but it is commanded of the disciples in the vine metaphor. They must abide in Jesus, and by virtue of that, with one another. But fish and relatives stink after three days. 
abiding with one another is hard. And abiding without one another can be devastating. In the year 2000, the blockbuster movie was Cast Away, starring Tom Hanks as Chuck Nolan, a young FedEx executive. Nolan survives four years on a deserted island after his flight to Malaysia is interrupted by a crash into the sea, killing everyone except him. Living for years in utter isolation, Nolan eventually forms a relationship with a volleyball, which he names Wilson, after giving it a face and eventually sprouts of something like hair. It's part of our divine nature this need to abide with others, even if we have to invent them. In the next chapter of John, Jesus prays to the Father, I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly united so that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them just as you have loved me. Professor Alice McKenzie says this theme of abiding in the very nature of authentic discipleship runs all through John. She recounts one of the short stories in Andre Debus' book entitled Meditations from a Movable Chair. Debus lost one leg and the use of the other in a terrible accident. His writing reflects how he experienced despair, learned acceptance, and finally found joy in the sacramental magic of the most mundane tasks. The story McKinsey relates is from a Christmas Eve a few years after his accident. He was divorced from his wife, and it was her year to have their daughters for Christmas Eve. He writes, The Christmas tree was in the living room, tall and full, and from the kitchen doorway I could see the front windows and the reflection of the tree and its ornaments and lights. My young daughter's Christmas stockings were hanging at the windows, but my girls were at their mother's house and would wake there Christmas morning and would come to me in the afternoon. I was a crippled father in an empty house. Feeling that same despair of being cast away with no human companions. Debus had to reach deeply into the reservoirs of his stories of faith and hope to persevere in dark times. Perseverance is an essential part of abiding. Believers must carry on in the face of struggle as Christ's own wounded presence abides in them. Debus writes as a Catholic with a hard-won faith. Abiding with Jesus has not shielded him from heartache. Still, persevering, continuing on, staying connected to the vine through the darkest hour has brought new insights into ancient truths. What must it be like to have prepared a place for those you love with all your heart, to have sent out the invitation, come and see, and to be left waiting? unable to make the next move. Now it was for them to come to him and for him to wait and watch. Mackenzie concludes her own thoughts, giving thanks that we are blessed to be called by Jesus to come and see and then to stay with him. She writes, we will never be unwelcome guests in the household of God. God calls us to abide in him. We are to welcome other people to abide in our lives and homes and in our guest rooms, the spaces that Jesus inspires and empowers us to create. Our lives may contain disappointments and people may let us down, but we can pledge not to leave God alone in an empty house that God has prepared for our abiding. Surely the promises of God are true. Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. We will abide. Thanks be to God.